Good afternoon and very welcome to this webinar on the predatory journals and predatory conferences. This is organized by the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. My name is Dan Larhammer and I am the president of the Academy. We will hear about and uh, discuss the extent of this problem and the harm it is causing to the scientific enterprise and to people's trust in science and scientists. I uh, will not use this precious time to say much here about the Academy of Sciences. Suffice to point out that our mission is to promote the sciences and strengthen their influence in society in a broad sense. And one of our many activities is to provide meeting occasions for scientists and discuss matters like we are doing today. Today's topic is one that may fall under the headline policy for science in the broad sense. That is how can the conditions for scientific research be organized in the most optimal way? Because one of the many aspects of this is the reporting of scientific achievements and results as we do in scientific journals and scientific conferences. This webinar is organized in connection with a recent report that was released three weeks ago by the Global Academy organization called the Inter-Academy Partnership, IAP. They had appointed an international expert group to look into this matter. And many of you have probably read at least parts of their report. I have read it with great interest, not with pleasure, I must say, but rather with horror. In a recent book called Plan S, written by the instigator of Plan S that we will hear a little bit about later, Robert Jan Smits, the author, claims that the profit made from su subscriptions by scientific journals and publishing houses, the profit made by them is, lo and behold, an astounding 25 billion euros per year. So it is understandable that scientific publishing is a lucrative business indeed. And if only a fraction of that profit would go back to research, it could really make a difference for scientific progress. Or if the profit is not made in the first place, the money could stay with the research. Uh, what if all scientific publishing could be done in journals without requirement for profit? or only a modest profit. One of the IAP experts in the committee is Stefan Eriksson from Uppsala University, who was nominated for the task by the Academy of Sciences. And we are very grateful that Stefan will present the report to us. Uh, before I give the word to Stefan, let me just describe very briefly how this webinar is organized. Stefan will summarize the report during some 30 minutes or so. Then we will hear Gustav Nelhans give a short presentation of a Swedish research project on this topic. Then we will have a panel discussion with Stefan and Gustav and three colleagues with different types of expertise that is important for our ways to, to deal with predatory journals. And finally, there will be time for some questions from you, the audience that you can write in the Q&A function if you are participating by Zoom. So now let me introduce Stefan. Stefan uh, is a, a pro an associate professor in research ethics and, as I said, a member of the IAP expert group. Uh, Stefan is also an expert on research misconduct and ways to handle that. So Stefan, the screen and the microphone are all yours, please. Thank you very much for inviting me to present this report and also for uh, at the outset to invite me to take part in this expert group. Um, let's see here. So, uh, funded by the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, uh, this IAP study, Combating Predatory Journals and Conferences, was launched in May 2020 and reported last month. And today I will outline some of our work and main findings and recommendations. First, uh, just a little bit about what is IAP. It's a global network of over 140 national and regional merit-based academies of science, engineering, and medicine, together with its four regional networks in Africa, the Americas, Asia, and Europe. And collectively, this 
uh, IAP members uh, represent over 30,000 who are some of the best scientists in the world and thus can provide a wealth of expertise and knowledge on which to draw for vital policy issues like this one. This report is the culmination of 22 months work, very interesting and, and satisfying to do, led by an international working group of experts, as Diane said, from different geographies, sectors, disciplines. They come from South Africa, Ethiopia, Benin, Egypt, Mexico, Brazil, Jordan, Bangladesh, Malaysia, Ireland, and indeed Sweden. The report's objectives were to define predatory and unethical practices in academic journals and conferences, to gauge the prevalence and impact, to examine global efforts to date to combat predatory journals and conferences, to understand the primary drivers or root causes of this phenomenon, and to provide concrete recommendations for a global strategy to address the problem that engage all key stakeholders. The report is actions-oriented, solutions-based, and speaks to the system as a whole. That is, the key stakeholders whose action can affect systemic change, and each needs to play their part. The report was formally launched on March 16. It's um, accompanied by a summary containing highlights and recommendations. It's available in seven different languages, English, French, Spanish, Mandarin, Russian, Portuguese, and Arabic. So that's as many people as possible can read it. And all you that has joined this seminar, we are, uh, would be very happy if you tried to send it out in all your networks. The report builds on an extensive literature review and draws on evidence from leading thinkers. We held stakeholder meetings with a variety of actors or stakeholders. Here you see uh, the various stakeholders through the research community. We have meetings with research funders, libraries, and the indexing services. We had one meeting dedicated to predatory conferences. We spoke to international science governance organizations, publishers, academia. We also had a meeting with Scopus and Elsevier. Certainly, there is an increasing interest in predatory publishing with a notable rise in the number of papers and commentaries over the past two years, even a book dedicated to it. In contrast, contrast, there is very little in the literature on predatory conferences. And what there is is largely anecdotal. Our report is timely and we think the most comprehensive and inclusive study on this issue. You may already be familiar with so-called predatory journals and conferences, but here's a quick summary drawing in large part from the international consensus definition published in Nature in 2019. You should note that whilst we use the most common term predatory, these practices are called different things in different countries, such as spurious, fraudulent, trash, garbage, dark, and deceptive. But they all, broadly speaking, solicited, solicit articles from researchers through practices that exploit the pressure on researchers to publish and present their work. Features of predatory practices include, but are not limited to, rapid pay to publish present or present models with, without rigorous or any peer review, uh, fake editorial or conference boards falsely listing respected scientists, fraudulent impact factors or metrics, journal and conference titles that are deceptively similar to legit ones, Aggressive spam invitations to solicit articles and abstracts, including outside of a researcher's own expertise. These genuinely fraudulent practices continue to evolve and are becoming more difficult to distinguish from low quality, unethical, and questionable publishing and conferencing practices. So much so that we present a new way of looking at them as a spectrum of predatory practices, a continuum of behaviors. Here's the spectrum for predatory publishing practices. On the very left, you find fraudulent journals. Those are uh, those that are committing internet fraud in some way or another. Such practices is illegal and might often be criminal even. For example, phishing or using false identities to deceive someone. Deceptive or deceitful journals are characterized by the publisher giving false or misleading information about the costs involved for publishing with them 
the services they provide, like indexing peer review or having an impact factor, or about whether the publisher is geographically based or who is the owner of said publication or is editor for it. Note that no criteria of this kind are necessary in order for the journal to be deceptive in an ethical sense, but they are all sufficient. It's enough to make a false claim in one of these regards to be considered a deceptive journal. In contrast to those deceptive journals, low quality journals are characterized by cumulative criteria or low quality markers. The more such criteria a journal fulfills and the worse it is with regard to each criterion, the worse its quality. Low quality journals should be subject to more nuanced evalu evaluation uh, according to how they fare against criteria of predatory practices. On the continuum, the working group has distinguished three close but different categories of low quality journals. Sorry, a single journal uh, might be hard to pin into one of these categories, but it's possible to distinguish some types. The third and best, so to speak, category of low quality journals are those that clearly try to be of service to science, although failing to do so in some instances. Low quality markers are present, but are not that many and also mitigated by the journal or publisher trying to provide a reliable and trustworthy arena for scientific discourse. Such journals might be called promising in that they, with some support, could develop into quality journals. Question quality journals is a category made possible by focusing on predatory practices rather than the substantive and categorical definition of predatory publishing. Some reputable journals or publishers have increasingly taken up practices marked by diminishing rigor and are perhaps trying to compete with journals of dubious quality. For example, one way of competing with other journals for scientists' submissions is to promise very rapid peer review. Such market considerations can result in papers being processed too fast, too cursory, lacking an emphasis on quality, which results in papers being published that are substandard of, of lesser worth. The sign of a quality journal is that it engages with its critics and discusses transparently ways to move forward, trying to rectify the situation. So one can call this category a transitional one. Either you insist in your practices and should be considered low quality, or you take action to remedy the situation and prove that you are a quality outlet. We also have a spectrum for predatory conferencing practices. In the interest of time, I will not go into these markers in any detail. You can refer to the report, but we essentially define a spectrum of conference practices, a broad set of dynamic predatory behaviors that range from genuinely fraudulent and deceitful practices, such as the conference not taking place or not returning fees paid after cancellations to low quality ones, for example, having poor organization or having too broad a focus. We anticipate these spectra can be useful tools that supplement other tools and resources already in the public domain. Here are a few. Some of these are publicly available like AuthorAid, while others like Cabell's are pay for subscription services. An increasing number of universities are developing their own guides and tips. They serve to help researchers in particular make informed choices about where they publish or present their work. And these tools are much needed. We conducted a global survey of researchers, the largest and most comprehensive done on this topic. Over 1,800 researchers from 112 countries responded to it. And if you uh, that are listening here participated, thank you. And over 80% told us that predatory journals and conferences are already a serious problem or on the rise in their country of work. So tools are welcome, according to the respondents. Most concerning, nearly a quarter of respondents told us that they had used the predatory journal or conference or didn't know if they had. Largely, largely but not exclusively those working in low and middle income countries. If we, if we were to use this as a proxy for the global research community as a whole, this equates to over a million researchers and billions of dollars of wasted or compromised research costs. 
When asked why they had used predator outlets, the main reasons as outlined and exemplified them on this slide were lack of awareness, the need to advance their career, convenience, was faster, cheaper, easier, and peer encouragement. This highlights the need for systemic and institutional changes to reduce perversive, perverse incentives for these predatory practices and prevent their normalization or institutionalization and to improve legit publishing and conference practices. Respondents worried that if left unchallenged, uh, predatory practices might result in poor or inaccurate research, fueling misinformation in public policy. It might undermine the research enterprise as a whole, at least public trust in it, and widening the gap still further between high and low income countries. The report provides examples of these impacts. Uh, I just want to show you one that was put in by one of my students at Uppsala University. It's about a journal, Progress in Physics, which is not in any reputable database. And you can see papers on, for example, free energy, that is a concept enabling a perpetual motion machine, which is physically impossible, of course, uh, or people writing about unmatter. So just an example from those we give about how uh, bad science might uh, come into the literature. Of course, it also has consequences for individuals. And we have some quotes to present that. And I think the, I can read the first one here because it's touching in a, in a way. Unfortunately, I had over 20 to 25 papers sacrificed in these journals. They can't be considered for promotion. And I become a questionable researcher everywhere my CV goes. Everyone looked down on me. I lost a few good friends and even broke into tears once in public because I was so ashamed. It was a truly painful experience. I hope no other academic experiences what I went through. The authors of the report identify three drivers or root causes. First, that um, we find the monetization or com commercialization of research output with the author pace model being especially prone to abuse. Secondly, that research evaluation systems exist where quantity overrides quality, together with the institutional drivers and incentives that shape the behavior of individual academics. And the lack of transparency in the peer review process, exacerbated by poor training, capacity, and recognition of peer reviewers. We think that if these are addressed, if there is a political will, ownership, and strong leadership, uh, predatory practices in academia can be successfully combated. combated. Our final recommendations target specific stakeholder communities who can make a difference. Here are, are our recommendations as an example for the publishing community. We recommend that you waive APCs to publish in open access journals for all researchers in low income countries, that we implement alternatives to the author pace model of open access funding, that we avoid, avoid proliferating numbers and issues of journals, that we have open and transparent policies, and that we facilitate quality of the quantity of papers through rigorous refereeing and review processes and so on. Academies have their own specific recommendations, of course, quite extensive. So here's a selection of notice since we are uh, sitting here with the academy. For example, an academy could highlight the dangers of predatory journals and conferences and sensitivize their members. It could mandate that all members of their academy avoid predatory journals and conferences and create disincentives to use them, including withdraw or suspend their academy membership. Ensure that any academy run grants programs disincentivize predatory publishing lobby the regional and global academies networks to take this issue seriously. If you have a publishing arm, implement or strengthen systems to minimize predatory behavior or infiltration. Continue to the, the debate, uh, contribute to the debate about, about alternative forms of scientific publishing in the future. 
endorse this report and implement its recommendations, of course. As already stated, multiple stakeholders must take action to help combat predatory academic practices. So in the report, we call on all stakeholders to raise awareness of predatory practices, the repercussions of not addressing them and their threat to both science and society, to avoid engaging with them legitimizing predatory journals and conferences, create disincentives for researchers who use them, whether knowingly or unknowingly, and spread good practice in publishing and conferencing choices. To work collaboratively on efforts to reduce the commercialization and monetization of academia, to promote open science and a move towards alternatives to the author pace model, to re reject the overuse and reliance on quantitative metrics in research evaluation, instead using quantitative metrics more rationally and intelligently, and promote ways of recognizing research quality. To strengthen the institutional transparent peer review in academia through merit systems, policies, and support structures at all levels. This last call to action is because predatory journals exploit challenges and weaknesses in the traditional closed peer review process. And without the need to validate the claims of conducting peer review, fraudulent journals can be difficult to distinguish from legit ones. Peer review has usually been closed because of not working perfect. It's fraught with biases. Reviewers might rate papers by famous authors or from top universities more highly. Editors and reviewers may be biased against authors who do not speak their own language or come from other regions. Gender bias has been reported in several studies. In contrast, transparent peer review is as at its core about the content of reviewers' reports getting posted alongside the article. And note that transparent peer review do not need to be fully open. Reviewers can choose to remain anonymous and journals can continue to use single or double blind review during the review process. So our conclusion here was that a hybrid transparent peer review model makes it possible to assert, ascertain the quality of, and rigor of, of the, the review. Peer review becomes more accountable because potential conflicts of interest, bias, and prejudice are easier to detect. And everyone involved in the process is potentially accountable for any misrepresentation or poor quality work. And such a model also helps to recognize the peer review process as scientific output in its own right. Consequently, this may offer greater incentive to publish in mainstream scientific journals where publication is aligned with recognized and verifiable outputs. Well, that concludes my introduction. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Stefan. This is extremely important reading and some of the findings in the report are truly shocking. So we have a lot to speak about here. Uh, but uh, before we move to the panel, we will hear a presentation by Gustav Nelhans about a study performed here in Sweden. Uh, Gustav is a senior lecturer at the Swedish School of um, Library and Information Science at the University in Borås. So without further ado, I leave the microphone and screen to you, Gustav. Thank you very much. Let's see if I can share my screen here also. And here are my slides. Let's see. You can, yes, I can see yeah, it very well. You can well. see them? Yes. Perfect. So my name is Gustav Nellans, and thank you very much for inviting me to this webinar. And together with this prominent set of scholars here, that I think that we will have a very interesting talk later. Uh, I've been invited to talk about a study that I, that I did a couple of years ago, but which uh, is very topical because I studied uh, the share of questionable publishing of Swedish researchers uh, uh, based on what we can find in Svepub, which is uh, the publication database that's, that is used by all the the uh, uh, Swedish universities. Uh, this uh, study that I will talk about was published in um, uh, Quantitative Science Studies. It's an open access journal. It was actually uh, what we call, or what the, the editors call, liberated from Elsevier because of the publishing practices of that uh, um, publisher. So uh, it is interesting to, to also add that this is part of a wider discussion about publishing in academia and what are 
good and uh, worse publishing practices in different ways. But specifically, this is about predatory publishing in the, the tradition that uh, uh, Stefan talked about before here. This study was published together with a colleague of mine who, whose name is Theo Bodin. He's uh, an associate professor at Karolinski Institute. And we were interested in actually looking at what is the actual share of, of, of publishing in, in this way. But before I will start talking about specifically about the study, I will say something about publishing in general. And let's see, um, because what this is scholar publication, and uh, as you might understand, there will be some maybe even rough words here in this in this presentation. But let's see. Uh, in one in one way, one can talk about publishing as the metadata. We have the title, we have the author, we have a journal where, where it is published in, and we also have uh, some other metadata to identify the specific volume number, year and page number and so on. This is used by citation databases, for example, to identify a reference to create a citation. But the pub publication is something more because it, because it is also part of the scholarly system. And we have scientific norms. We have, of course, different kinds of outlets, such as journals, different kinds of documents that we publish. And the content of, of the article is also quite standardized. But what happens sometimes, what can be the problem, is that it is possible to today publish, or at least get something accepted, which doesn't, which looks like a publication, but which doesn't contain any scholarly content. And this is a, a manuscript that was submitted by two researchers who got tired of all the, the spam that they got. So they submitted an article with these uh, seven year, uh, words, or whatever it is, over and over again and tested, will this be accepted? Uh, they even uh, put a model and a scatter plot showing the same words over and over again. Uh, this was, of course, uh, accepted as long as they would pay the, the fee. I think it was quite low, like $300 or something like that, quite uh, a lot less than what we uh, sometimes pay in auto processing charges for other uh, more serious uh, journal articles. But the idea that we can uh, uh, trust public publishing might be linked to, for example, the Mertonian norm system of science, which says that, that uh, science is available to everybody. Uh, it has a universal, uh, uh, strives towards universalism. The researcher should be disinterested towards his or her own work, but mainly the, uh, which is most important here, the organized skepticism idea that we review each other's work and we don't trust anything just because it's said, but because it's published and uh, sourced in, in a good way with arguments that are, are reliable and so on. So the peer review system is very important, of course, but as, as everything else in uh, 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 culture, even publishing changes. And what we call publishing today is not exactly what was called publishing in, in the 1600s, for example. And peer review is also something that has developed and it will still continue to develop in different ways. So, what uh, so the study, this is the study. And uh, as I mentioned, we, we studied the share of, of uh, 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 questionable publishing in Swedish academia. Uh, Let's see. Uh, of course, I use the term uh, questionable instead of predatory. And that is also because this is something, as Stefan talked about a little before, there is a spectrum of different varieties of publishing in this way. And we have had it long before we talked about, for example, open access as a publishing uh, practice. We had uh, vanity press, for example, or fake journals and so on. Uh, uh, so. The, the, this phenomena has existed before, but of course it has exploded in a way as is shown in this uh, report in the number of, of journals, for example, that are available. So I use the term uh, questionable publishing or tvivelaktig publishing in Swedish. And yeah, um, we can skip that one, but uh, the, it could look something like this. You get invited by somebody claiming to have a journal, it often has an ISSN number because any, any publication can get that. But when you look at the content, you can see that they have not exactly read what you have published. They ask you to publish, for example, in this case, a seminar paper or, or a conference paper that I did. And they even invite me to also be an ed editor for the journal, even though I don't even know this journal at all. It is not in a subject that I actually am aware of. 
and it claims to be indexed in uh, databases that actually either don't exist or are not relevant really. Anybody can get a Crossref uh, uh, DUI, for example. It doesn't, there's no quality control here, but they also claim to have impact factor, but not the general uh, journal impact factor that Clarivate delivers, but the universal impact factor, which I'm not even sure exists at all. And they take uh, a fee, of course, which is quite low, as I mentioned before. Sometimes they, they even uh, claim to accept payment in Bitcoin, which of course would be a telltale sign that this is quite strange uh, uh, outlet to publish it. So the study that we did, we, we used the blacklists. So we used lists of, of uh, 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 journals uh, that had been identified as problematic uh, based on a couple of different sources. One was actually a, a list created by the Journal of Health and Medical Education in Iran, who identify uh, what they call invalid and fake publications. We also used, uh, a, uh, there is a white list, which is called uh, DOAJ, which uh, lists good open access journals, but they also list the journals that they remove. And we used the, the titles that were removed based on suspected editorial misconduct by the publisher, quite severe criteria. And then we also used Cabell's blacklist, as uh, Stefan uh, mentioned before, this list has about 60 criteria for what is uh, predatory publishing in, in their uh, terminology. And we, we had to use some uh, specifics because some of the criteria they use are not very severe, really. So to be able to choose the ones that actually we could call questionable, we had to create a, a specific way of working with this. So, for example, we found severe criteria less severe criteria and gray zone criteria for what they call predatory practices, which I would say does not actually say that this is predatory publishing. Uh, gender bias is a problem, of course, but it's maybe not the problem of predatory practices, as the, the uh, criteria are number 32. So we used, if there is, was one severe, or maybe it was three less severe criteria, then we uh, matched it in our database. We took everything that was published in Swedish research between 2012 and 2017, and we looked not at individuals, because I thought that what would be a little bit problematic. So instead, we matched this, this at the uh, uh, university level. Uh, first of all, I can say that we, the numbers that we got say something like this. On average, 1% uh, of what was published, or 0.8% that was published in 2012, that is uh, uh, indexed in Svepub by Swedish sco scholars, could be matched to one or more of these databases. But we also see a, a slight uh, falling trend during these years, and of course it, it only covers 2012 to 2017, so we cannot say that exactly what has happened afterwards. But it's a quite clear uh, trend line, at least uh, in, in this regard. What is very interesting is to look at the different uh, universities. And here I, I chose not to, to give the names of the universities, but rather list them as old or, or uh, more the traditional uh, universities. We have the special universities as Karolinski Institute and Chalmers. We have the new universities at the time and the university colleges. And the color here represents the share of uh, uh, matched publications for every year. And as you see, there is a quite big difference between the older universities and the university colleges and the newer universities. Can also be seen in this uh, list here, giving both me means and me median values. There are some differences between different uh, universities, but there is some trend. And of course, I have not much time here, so I will just say something about why it can look like this. Uh, one argument that we make in the article is uh, that, of course, there can be uh, differences between different kinds of university, uh, uh, university standards, so to speak, but uh, that, uh, so that uh, uh, university colleges maybe have a smaller uh, or, or less uh, in, uh, in pu publishing uh, practice, so to speak, uh, experience with publishing. Uh, but I think that another reason is that uh, at the university colleges, there are uh, more subjects that are more interdisciplinary that come from uh, disciplines that are 
created more newly, uh, they might be more multi paradigmatic and therefore uh, not having uh, uh, a standard uh, uh, that, that has been developed as much as in many of the bigger universities. So it might be that uh, there are the same uh, share within these subject areas, even in the older universities, because we did not specifically look at that. But we see that some, these are the uh, words from the titles in the journals, which these uh, articles were published in. In total, we found about 2000 articles that were matched to uh, uh, these databases. So that is the data set that we worked with. Uh, I can actually will not say so, so more, much more, but to say that it would be interesting to talk about more and hear from the audience about your thoughts about these results. So thank you. Thank you very much, Gustav. Yeah, some of the examples you mentioned are, although they are annoying and frustrating, they are also a bit amusing. <laughs> In fact, it's, it's a, a, amazing what practices there are out there. Uh, all right, before we move on to discuss with the, the panel, we have one question in the Q&A, and I think it relates to what Stefan was uh, describing before. The question is, could you just explain again what you mean with a hybrid peer review system? Could you say something about that, please? Yeah, there's been a strive for um, open peer review in the recent years, and there's a lot of different notions of openness. It could be open identity of reviewers or people that you review or the process and so there's a lot of different models but they all sort of run into the same problem that uh, peer reviewers are not really happy with being put to the spot in that way uh, and also that a lot of people are still sort of keeping uh, uh, they would like to keep the model of, of being having blind peer review in order to to, to counteract all these biases. So uh, this transparent peer review is one kind of openness which can make it possible to have a hybrid model between openness and traditional peer review processes, uh, made, making it possible both to have blinded peer review and, and uh, but still publish the reports. So for example, I, I teach PhD students and they are often very concerned to be, be uh, peer reviewing their, their senior colleagues and what will happen if they are critical and react the paper. So they could still be conf confidential peer review from them, but their peer review report could be inspected and checked for accuracy and, and that it, a real peer review has taken place. So that, that's the hybrid system. Thank you for the good question. Thanks, Stefan. There were a few more questions in Q&A, but we will save those for the discussion later. So I will now address the panel and let me first introduce the three additional members on the panel. We have Anna Dreber Almenberg, who is the Johan Björkman Professor of Economics at Stockholm School of Economics. And Anna is also a member of uh, the Academy of Sciences. And we have Lynn Kamerlin, Professor of Structural Biology at Uppsala University. And she is presently participating from Virginia. And we have Bo Söderström, who is Associate Professor and Editor-in-Chief for AMBIO, which is a journal of Environment and Society, which is published by the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. Uh, together with um, the Springer Nature Publishing House. Uh, so welcome to the panel. And um, I would first like to ask uh, all of you in turn, um, what you found most surprising about this report, uh, either in a positive or a negative way. And uh, let's start with, with Lynn. Thank you so much, everyone, and thanks, Dan, for the introduction. So what really jumps out at me? Now, most of us as researchers are very familiar with the problems of predatory publishing, and it's been plaguing us for a long time. And we also know that predatory conferences exist. For me, it's mainly a plague in my inbox because there's the time sink of deleting all these emails. But it was really a surprise that 
they're an actual problem and that people go to them and it becomes a huge industry of people ending up at these fake conferences and the people go to them some are scammed into going to them but others go there basically uh, knowing full well they're fake and why would our colleagues do that so really the full scope of the problem of predatory conferences was a big shock to me thank you lynn then we move on to anna what was most shocking or surprising to you? Surprising in a positive way was the discussion about transparency in peer review. So we're going to come back to this later, but I'm thinking a lot about problems with replicability and reproducibility, reliability of scientific results. And some of the solutions that I think we need to address those problems are also relevant for addressing predatory journals. So I think there are some uh, good uh, symbiosis there. happening. All right, thank you. And then, Bo, what about you? Yes, I agree with, with what Lynn said. Uh, the, the scale of the problem was something that surprised me. You know, I think I read 15,500 predatory journals. So it's, it's amazing. For me, I, I, I just, I've experienced the avalanche of emails coming, uh, in, inviting me to submit to different journals and conferences. It's, and, and during the last two years, this has been just enormous increase in, in this number of emails, despite I blacklist them all the time. Uh, and another surprise was that there was, so, that there was a, such a big problem outside the developing world. 2% uh, of Swedish uh, researchers submit to predatory journals. That was a big surprise for the Gustav study. Yeah, so let's uh, move on to Gustav then, who has done research in this field. Was there anything that surprised you in this report? Well, maybe not uh, surprised, maybe, but I, I was pleasantly surprised in a way then uh, that the report gives a very broad presentation of the spectrum of questionable publishing. And uh, the, the, I think that the, the term predatory is quite problematic because it focuses on uh, the journals or the editors of these journals as predators, and then the researchers would be some kind of prey. But uh, it's quite easy, not every all the time, of course, but quite easy to identify these uh, these practices. And I think that we should focus a lot on which researcher, uh, not who does it, but the practices of uh, choosing to publish in this way, and maybe also the reasons for this, which of course comes from the incentives of publishing, wh where quantitative measures are used as as uh, um, indicators of quality instead of doing a real evaluation of research. And th this is found, for example, in those um, merit applications where one often do not evaluate the content of, of the research, but rather how much you have published together with your supervisor or how much you have distanced yourself from the, the supervisor instead of the content. So I think this is important. Thank you. And um, what about you, Stefan, who have been in this field for a while? And what did you and the other international experts, what were you surprised by? Was there anything? Well, I think like Lynn, we were shocked by uh, the notion that, and this is anecdotal, but we, we cited from an expert that is investigating predatory conferences that there are now more predatory conferences in the world than alleged ones. And that, that is, uh, if that's true, it's, it's really disturbing. Otherwise, I would say that uh, I would point to the survey because, I mean, I, the report itself, I'm not surprised by, but the survey we did came up with two really interesting things, I think. One was, why do people engage with this? Uh, and we had this tradition that you are unaware or you find it convenient or you're perhaps also a supporter of open access. But a fourth idea that came up in the material was that colleagues had recommended it. And I, was a bit, I had this idea that this is something going on in the dark and not something that is openly discussed in between colleagues, but apparently it is open on the recommendation. But use this journal. It's nice and easy to publish with them. So it, it's, uh, it's about the cultural environment, about the research environment that we live in, where this uh, come up. And the second thing from the survey that I found really interesting was that we have for a long, long time heard again and again that, of course, it is the, it is the young and inexperienced researchers that fall for this, that are 
targeted and that pays and then become scandalized. But um, both Gustav's uh, sort of research and, and the survey answers here stated that it's, it's no, it's, it's as you as, as uh, often uh, professors and senior researchers and, and experienced people that uh, make use of these uh, conferences and, and journals. Um, and, and that was to me a surprise, really, it was. Could it be that more senior people are not used to this uh, way of marketing by email? I'm not sure. When we, we have done a little study we built on Gustav's work and looked at one scientific and discipline in 18 and 19, namely nursing science. And there we found a number of professors that uh, they were two thirds of people publishing in predatory journals were professors. And apparently quite a few of them have this as a strategy because they do it again and again. And they are also in some cases editors for, for these journals. So they, they have found a home in this business. So I, I would imagine that they are doing it on, on purpose because they find it uh, they have it as a strategy to uh, get ahead in, in academia, I think. It's really sad to see those who should, should know better uh, that they feed the system in this way. Yeah. If I may add to this, uh, one thing that I was rather shocked by was the consequences that were described by some of the individuals in the survey that they were considered... Uh, ineligible for positions, et cetera, when they had these kinds of publications in their CV. Uh, were there many that reported that? I forget the number. Well, I don't have the number in my head either, but, but yeah, it was quite a few that, that talked about uh, bad experiences from, from being found out. Uh, and that is a bit surprising, I agree, because we think perhaps, we thought that as writing the report as well, that one of the problem is that we don't react, that people do not take action when they find someone who has published in, or gone to conferences. But uh, apparently some people do. <laughs> and mm -hmm. then, then the consequences might be uh, of a social kind that, that you actually get uh, socially uh, punished in a way by, by your colleagues that, that this was wrongdoing. Yeah, those stories tell a clear warning signal to the, the community that one should stay away from these journals. And that makes me even more sad to hear that some senior scientists are using them because they can probably get away with it in a better way if they already have permanent positions. Maybe it will affect their, their success rate when it comes to obtaining grants in the future. Uh, all right. Um, so I think all of you were surprised by negative findings one way or another. Uh, so maybe there isn't that much positive to find in this. Uh, if one should try anyway, uh, what has been a little bit enjoyable to read occasionally are the pranks that have been planted when people submit these fake manuscripts and see how easily they can get approved. And, and some of, of them are really entertaining to read. But of course, in, in the end, it's sad to see that happen as well. Uh, OK, uh, let's proceed to a, a different aspect of this. And um, I know, uh, Lynn, that you have been very much involved in the discussions about open access. and the plan S that I, I mentioned in my introduction. Um, can you start by explaining a little bit perhaps what, what the plan S was about or is about? So plan S is something that's evolved with time. It was announced in 2018 and it's a coalition of funders, mainly European. Now it's also from other parts of the world, both private and public. And so uh, the general idea is to accelerate the transition towards open access. And it does this, it's probably one of the most draconian open access mandates that's been uh, put forward by anyone to date, because especially in its initial format, it effectively banned publication 
publication in hybrid journals completely. And so uh, in the context of the report, one of the things I thought that was actually positively good, maybe not surprising, but really good, was that the report used a spectrum of uh, questionable practices and that it emphasized how legitimate publishers can also engage in dubious pra practices. And, it's, and if we think about the impact that Plan S has had on the landscape. So if we go to Plan S 2018 initially announced, it's defining very, very narrowly where and how researchers can publish. And also initially there was supposed to be a cap on APC, which eliminates all these higher quality uh, society journals. I mean, uh, not necessarily just Nature Family, but also many society specific like American Chemical Society by uh, open access. And so predatory publishing, it's been a big problem before Plan S. Open access does not mean predatory publishing and there are even high volume doesn't mean predatory. There is quality high volume as well. The problem is that even though coalition has claimed they don't favor a particular business model, um, coalition S, the, these are the coalition of funding agencies that put forward Plan S. Their rules favor a form of publishing that's uh, a dream come true for a publisher who wants to be predatory. And it's also a big temptation for a legitimate publisher who wants to start a whole range of uh, second tier open access journals to meet Plan S criteria and so on. And so I think even though Plan S did not create the problem of predatory and questionable publishing, but it's deeply accelerated it. Uh, and also, if it really succeeds in flipping to open access in a way that the only way to fulfill the criteria is pay to publish, I think that's going to be very dangerous for the publishing landscape. And I say this as an otherwise strong proponent of open. Yeah, I think most of us are, are very much in favor of um, um, the ideas behind Plan S, but it's a matter how to implement it in a constructive way. Is there anyone else on the panel who would like to comment on this as well? Uh, you know, Gustav, you has been, have been much in, involved in the discussions about Plan S as well. Yeah, uh, I agree with some of the comments here, but I think that today it's not relevant to talk about how Plan S was initially presented. And today, uh, almost all university consortia have, have created uh, read and publish deals together with the big five uh, publishers which means that nobody pays a dollar for publishing, even in nature, Swedish, the Bib Samko source has, a, has a, 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 a transformative agree, a, agreement with them. Of course, it costs a lot of money and open access hasn't uh, uh, saved the, the economic system when it comes to publishing. It's in fact more expensive now than before. But uh, I think that this is a process and Plan S, well, we can talk about that, but I don't think that it is that relevant. I have not seen any data showing that Plan S has driven predatory publishing and the empirical data would be the evidence that I would like to see. Mm. Yeah, as Lynn pointed out, uh, uh, this whole trend started way before Plan S was initiated. Uh, Lynn, you wanted to say something more. I just wanted to make a comment, uh, adding to Gustav's comment about power agreements. And so, of course, this is a Swedish panel and a Swedish audience. And it's easy to forget if you don't interact with other parts of the world, just how privileged we are in Sweden to have these power agreements. So I've spent a lot of time in the US and hardly any US uh, libraries actually have anything comparable to what we have in Sweden. So there it's the upfront pay $5,000 a paper. This includes prestigious universities in the US. And also even within Europe, it's a minority of countries. You can see the lists of uh, organizations and uh, libraries uh, publishers have power agreements with. So this is actually very dangerous because if it's free to publish for a Swedish researcher and $5,000 for a US researcher, even before we start talking about countries for whom this is a sci-fi sum of money. So the additional problem which is separate and beyond today's panel is segregation of the uh, publishing landscape into people who have means and don't. And I think that would be very dangerous for the scientific enterprise as a whole, but in the context of predatory publishers, that's then when the predatory, the predatory publisher with a $500 publishing fee can come in and so on. So it does actually catalyze other dangerous unintended consequences. All right, yeah, we'll have to keep an eye on that. Okay, there was something else I wanted to discuss with you. And um, that is how uh, the predatory publishing may interdigitate with um, another problem we've had with scientific publishing over the past several years, or that has received a lot of attention during the past several years, namely the replication problem. And there are several fields of research 
where uh, researchers have tried to replicate published studies, but it turns out that there is a surprisingly low degree of replications that uh, can be confirmed. And uh, I know, Anna, you have looked very closely at this, and this is something one could fear maybe will be fed also by um, uh, the predatory journals. So what's your take on that? Well, yeah, so one of my favorite topics, <laughs> not predatory journals per se, but- the, Yeah, the so maybe you could uh, explain in, in somewhat detail what the replication crisis is and how okay. it has been investigated. Yeah, so there are many replication projects uh, and we've been involved in some of these and in these replication projects, we typically try to take experiments published by others in economics, psychology, behavioral sciences, for example. We try to redo these experiments using the same methods and materials as in the original studies, but on new and larger samples. So same methods, new data, basically. And then we try to see to what extent do the res results replicate. And these are largely quantitative uh, results that we try to see. Can we get the same sort of, can we get statistically significant results if that's what the original study showed? And we look at mainly so-called top or high quality journals, top journals like Nature and Science when we do these replication projects. And we find pretty, I think, sad replication rates in the sense that somewhere between one third and two thirds of results do not replicate. So that's a little bit worse. And I mean, if we're worried about the problems of reliability of results in predatory journals, there are, we're all, we should already be worrying about non-predatory journals. And as far as I know, there aren't any comparisons between predatory and non-predatory journals uh, on this particular topic. Um, there are similar results for medicine and cancer research with uh, really low uh, replication rates. And now we're just talking about experiments. I mean, most of the data used in, for example, the quantitative social sciences wouldn't be on experiments, but would be on archival data, registered data, confidential data, and other things, where for obvious reasons, you can't replicate the experiment because it's a so policy experiment or something sort of that happened by chance that doesn't happen by chance again, like a, an election outcome or something. So then we can't even talk about replication, but can discuss reproducibility. If we redo the same analysis with the same data, do we get the same results? Or are the results robust? Uh, if we do robustness analysis, sensitivity analysis, et cetera. And for such type of data, open data becomes very important. So we can actually look at the same data and redo the analysis in different ways. So I think, I mean, when we try to address uh, the replication crisis, we come up with solutions that I think are pretty relevant to this discussion of predatory versus non-predatory journals. Um, so what do we want in the review process that can help us get more reliable results? Of course, we don't want any bias. Um, we hope that reviewers are not biased and there are reasons to think that they in many instances are biased. Um, we want quality control in the form of actual peer review, ideally, pre-publication and perhaps also post-publication, uh, open data when possible, open code and analysis. And all of these things should lead to more reliable results. And these are all things that are typically absent from predatory journals. And I think if we push for all of these more in non-predatory journals, the difference between these types of journals will become more obvious and we will also at the end of the day get more reliable results. Um, and I think a key issue here that was brought up earlier is also to increase transparency in peer review. So I'm personally not a big fan of signing reviews, and I think that uh, introduces elements of nepotism and other things. But to have sort of the anonymous reviews plus replies of authors being published on uh, along with the publication, I think that helps prove that this is a real public publication. This is not a predatory paper. Um, but, and, and I think it would just need to better review. So this is something many of the nature journals are now pushing for, and I think that should become more uh, prevalent. So as if the replication problem wasn't enough challenge for us in research, there's a big risk that um, the predatory journals will make it worse in the future. If, if more sloppy studies are published with poor or negligible peer review, one may fear that it will be worse. Uh, anyone else on the panel who has thought about this problem. Is, is this something you touched upon in uh, the expert group, Stefan? Or... 
Well, in, in a way, I mean, what we discussed is, of course, the robustness of, of research results. And, and uh, it might be very easy for people to question that if we both have a replication crisis and a predatory crisis, if we call it that. And it's so easy then to point to science and say, that, oh, they publish in bad journals and it can't be replicated and proves to be false, that and that. And, and uh, we, get, we, we lose the trust in research, which is so much needed uh, for a lot of the challenges we, we face. So, um, and, and that also goes with the commercialization pro sort of process that goes on that with more and more profit-driven research publications coming out. And, and uh, having that, um, you can question it on, on that grounds, uh, on those grounds as well. And uh, I, I'm a bit worried, and we are, the report writers were a bit worried that we will sort of, uh, by writing something like our report, uh, uh, help undermining the public trust in, in science because we are pointing to these problems. And I, I'm certain Anna is, is facing the same thing that if you go around speaking about you can't replicate so many studies, it, it, yeah, why then trust in research at all? And uh, so, that, so we have really spoken about this being so important to face mm -hmm. these challenges, yeah. Yeah, I think it's extremely important that we uh, explain that we are fully aware of these problems and we are determined to do something about it. I mean, we usually say that the strength of science and research is that it is a self-correcting process, um, probably more so than most other activities in our societies. So here we have some work to do. Okay, let's turn to something else. Uh, uh, Boo, uh, uh, you as an editor, of course, can look at this from that side also. So uh, to begin with, should uh, a scientific journal be allowed to make a profit? Uh, um, at, at least we need to cover our costs in some way. Um, I can speak for Ambry that we, we, do, we do make a profit from, from publishing uh, and that money goes directly into the academy uh, promoting science. But of course, the, the owner of Spring and Nature is a family in, in, in Stuttgart. And uh, I, I suppose they make a big profit out of publishing as well. Uh, and it's not really for me to say if that is more morally or ethically correct or right, but um, what I can say is that Ambio as a journal, uh, we've been rather bad showing to the authors what they get when publishing, what they get for their money when publishing with Ambio. Um, so, we, so we trade in excellent peer review. Peer review. So we, 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 it takes a lot of time for our editors uh, handling the peer review process, and they're actually reimbursed. That's quite unusual for, for many journals. So our editors are reimbursed for all articles um, forwarded to external review. My salary is paid in full, so from, from, um, from the royalty, royalties. And the major problem right now is how do we expect the reviewers to continue to, to do the reviews for our journal, especially when we have they be, they become diluted with the predatory and, and also the many non-predatory journals coming up. So so that is a major problem for all uh, all journals right now. Are you facing problems recruiting reviewers? Yeah, right now we have about forty percent acceptance rate to our invitations to review, and that has been quite stable during the last five five years actually. So we're quite fortunate that way that we have a, many, many people in our, our kind of, our science, uh, they, they know of Ambio. We've been around for 50 years. So when they get the invitation, they, they usually accept. Uh, but we're starting to, to invite five, six people at once to, to, uh, to avoid any further delays in the review process. Yeah, this dilution phenomenon is probably quite significant. Mm. And uh, even disregarding all the 
potential predatory journals, I probably decline three out of four invitations and it's probably the same thing for many other researchers. Mm. Um, we should emphasize also that there are many other societies that run scientific journals and whatever profit they may make is then used to organize their own conferences or provide travel grants, especially for young scientists and so forth. So uh, any profit from the publishing can be fed back into the, the scientific enterprise. Mm. Um, how would you recommend then, uh, especially a young scientist, what we heard before also that maybe senior scientists would require this advice also. How can one reason to, to choose to find a trustworthy journal as opposed to these potentially predatory ones? We've heard about the list, we know citation impact, what else can we use? I know that Spring and Nature, the publisher you promotes is the think, check and submit um, uh, routine and that's a very good thing but as, as a young scientist I would say that ask your colleagues, your more experienced colleagues at the department, uh, where do you publish? And as always, I say that they should check the, their own reference lists when they're, when they're kind of scanning for different journals where to submit. If they check their own reference list, they will probably find suitable journals from, from that, from that uh, list. And when checking out a new journal, uh, when you check the aims and scope of that journal, you should, of course, never fall for the lure of quick peer review. Peer review takes time. Uh, it's, we have 30 days peer review time for, uh, when we invite reviewers. And that is, we've been discussing of cutting it down to three weeks, but the editor group said, no, it, 30 days is kind of the minimum amount of time to, to, to make a peer review. So, so, um, so, so you should not fall, fall for the lure of quick peer review and low APCs. I totally agree. Uh, okay. Uh, another topic I wanted to discuss with you, and especially in relation to, to Gustav's study, is how uh, these problems and challenges differ, may differ between countries. And uh, I think Lynn touched upon this also, that there are differences between countries when it comes to subsidies for publishing and so forth. Uh, so uh, shall we begin with, with Stefan? You started by describing the, the broad representation that you had on, on your international committee. Were there bigger differences than you expected or how does it look? No, I don't think so. I, there was a perception quite a few years ago that it was centered on certain areas of the world where predatory publishers were, where the operations worked out from. Uh, today we find it everywhere. In Sweden we have two predatory publishers, one based in Linköping and one in Gothenburg. Um, it was, we had the perception that it was much more common in, in certain, in, in certain low-income and middle-income areas. Doesn't really, there is a bit more, but not much. I mean, there are journals where are typically populated by Americans, for example, that are obviously predatory. Uh, so uh, in that sense is that what differs is the kind of system we have built for publication. In some parts of the world, it's very unusual that you must have a published paper in a thesis as a master student or PhD student, for example. But in other countries, that's rather common. Uh, medical sciences in Sweden, you are expected to publish in international journals, uh, even at master students sometimes. So uh, those systems differ. Something else that differs are the, the economical model for publishing and uh, subsidizing uh, open access publishing. Uh, the most interesting, which was a novelty for me, was LAT index, uh, the Latin American way of doing this, where the state is paying for uh, open access journals. Uh, so it's free for everyone to, to publish with them. And the they have much, much lesser problems with predatory journals. Of course, people from there also publish in these, but 
the national systems works uh, much better. So the LAT index model is something that we could learn from in other parts of the world. I think it's uh, successful in avoiding these problems. That sounds like the way to go. How did they manage to uh, start that? Well, basically, they just said that let's start uh, to have journals that we, we pay for, that are free to publish with, that we pay for through our universities and, and educational systems uh, gov from the governments. And mm. uh, they put up a big index where you can find this uh, called LAT index. Um, and it apparently works very, very nice. We had a couple of people from Latin America with, in the group, working group, and they were very, very satisfied with this system. And we, we from the rest of the world, were sort of in aid for, 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 for the, how they had succeeded to do something such, uh, such mm. a good thing. Mm. Were research councils and uh, academies involved in establishing yeah, yeah. this? Okay. Very much so, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that's something we should probably try to copy. Uh, Gustav, I was wondering, has other countries performed uh, studies like yours so we can perform comparisons? Mm -hmm. Well, actually, there are a couple of uh, other uh, countries that have done that. In Flanders, for example, they also have a similar bibliometric model when it comes to funding of universities, citation-based, uh, as in Sweden, and as opposed to Norway and Finland and Denmark, which has a publication-based model. And they did a study, uh, or they do a study every year uh, by their scientific, uh, scientific community. And they more or less say that they have the same kind of data as I, that I have, both regarding the share, but also regarding the actual uh, amount of publishing. Because if there's something that is a little bit problematic with the study that we are talking about today, is that we are talking about a lot about how, how researchers perceive uh, predatory publishing, but not there is uh, there are some data, but not uh, not so much data about uh, the actual amount. And of course, it's very hard to do the study. We had a lot of methodological problems in, in the study that we did. But uh, the question is: Is it actually raising the number of, of pub publications or the share of publishing in these journals or, and the conferences, or is it the number of, of uh, uh, spam email that increases? That is not completely clear. And I think that there is a need for much more studies and uh, the ones that Stefan did also taking a share of data and then looking into it and, and trying to look into specific disciplines how, how it works in different disciplines is very very interesting to to uh, cover a little bit but uh, well uh, not yet we, we were not funded when we tried to get funding for the study a, a year back but that could be because it wasn't a good uh, uh, proposal but maybe we can do some more studies because, because there are researchers in other countries we had a, a um, a conference panel at the Science Technology Indicators, the Scientometric Conference last year, which I uh, hosted, or I didn't host the conference, but the panel, and we had researchers from Denmark, Finland, Flanders, uh, and uh, Sweden who discussed it from different positions. So there is uh, a lot of discussion, especially with regards to the incentives of publishing, which I think is one of the drivers here. Fine. Yeah. We shall soon move on to uh, take some questions from the Q&A. We have received quite a few. But before we do that, I thought we should wrap things up a little bit uh, at this stage. And um, I, th I think it's good to, to point out again the major actions we can take. Uh, and uh, Stefan described very nicely some of the things that uh, the international report recommends. But Stefan, if you should... Uh, emphasize a few of these. Which one do you think are the most important for us? I imagine you speak about the individual researcher now, what, what we do as yes, researchers. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah. On television, it's often three things you should mention. So I, I will <laughs> keep to three things, even though there are many, many things we could do. But I think as an individual, the major responsibility, first one, is to learn to identify predatory journals. Mm. Uh, see through them, uh, learn how to spot their weaknesses. Uh, and I think the major thing is not it being on a list or so, because you can't rely too much on these lists or, or what people write, but just looking at the journal, looking at the papers published with it, does it show signs of editorial oversight, care, layout, language, 
references, sections coming in the right, right place, picture quality. Is this a quality outlet or not? Learn to see the weak spots, I think, is very, very important so that you can yourself uh, assume responsibility for where you publish. Second, I would say that dare to speak up. <laughs> uh, if you actually can sort of, when you have started, uh, people will soon follow, I think. We have, at my own faculty, we have called people out a couple of times. No, that's not a real publication. This is a predatory one. And now there's a big awareness that, that uh, yeah, you will be challenged if you come with a dissertation with a predatory paper in it. And you will be forced to make it to a manuscript and not uh, use it as a, and sort of legitimizing the, the journal in question. So dare to speak up, people will follow. And thirdly, we have spoken about peer review, and I think be a peer reviewer um, in pre publication peer review, journal peer review, post publication peer review, but science thrives on peer review. And uh, uh, one study I'm planning to do, I hope to do, is to look at uh, data on how much people pu publish and if they actually peer review three articles for every article they publish, because that is what is needed. Uh, often you have two to three reviewers, and if there are to be a balance in the system, uh, we need to get the system to work. <laughs> and therefore we need have to have people actually doing peer review. And But as Anna also said, it's also important to do peer review in the, the whole scientific process. It's a peer review process from pre-publication to post-publication. That is what what it is. So we need to take that uh, at heart and become peer reviewers, every one of us. That would be my message. Reviewers for the reliable journals. All right. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, let's see if um, the other members of the panel want to add something to this. What else can we do? Lynn, what uh, do you think we as researchers can contribute? So I think, as we've discussed, one of the things with these predatory conferences and predatory publishers is that they actually catch senior researchers as well. Although there is a scary component I touched on earlier that some senior researchers know full well what they're doing. And so something I have to keep explaining to my colleagues, so the really, in a way, problematic area, the, they're the blatant predatory publishers with very strange emails that you just delete at once. But there are publishers that operate on this gray zone between between predatory and non-predatory. And one of uh, the very popular tactics that I see many of my colleagues fall for is that they get someone you know to organize a special issue and they often offer APC waivers to senior reputable scientists. And so the reputable scientist gets invited by a friend to this publisher that maybe isn't entirely legit, but kind of looks legit. But the problem is that as soon as that paper is published in their journal, that's the kind of thing they're going to wave to basically scam other people to publish in their journal. And and also, even within some journals, the quality of peer review can vary radically. So you can get excellent peer review if you're someone high profile and then high profile people agree to, you know what I mean? And then sort of, so I think as the start of senior researchers, it's really important to not play that game. And if it's a journal that you don't know really well and has a reliable quality brand, and especially if you're very well established and they're offering you an APC waiver, that should be a red flag. And we should talk to our colleagues about these problems and not just apparently or junior colleagues but also our senior colleagues and when we have bad experiences with a publisher I think we shouldn't be afraid to speak up about it because it's the only way we can kind of get a better publishing landscape so these would be just some suggestions. Mm. Thank you Lynn. Uh, let's move to Anna. What else can we do? Yes, I, I agree with what <laughs> you just said so maybe that's not that fun for the discussion, but I mean, I think we should push the non-predatory journals to become better too. And I think that would make it easier for everyone to differentiate. I mean, authors, readers, and everyone differentiate between predatory and non-predatory journals. And we can do it as reviewers, but so in many fields, I think, I mean, some fields, this is less of a problem with predatory journals when we already have most journals being run by scientific associations. So that's pretty common in economics. So I'm, I'm actually guessing that the problem is smaller there, but maybe I'm naive. Um, but there, as editors, we can, of course, try to improve our journals and make it cl even clearer that they are of high quality and non-predatory. So 
we are reviewers, but we're also associate editors and editors and can push for things there. So let's ask then an editor for a reputable, well-established journal. What can we do as scientists? Yeah, I, I think uh, to actually speak about the value of the peer review because the, the peer review improves all papers and, and not to burden the reviewer community with uh, papers that are, that are out of scope or kind of maybe if it's not not holds promise. If you, if you know for sure that the paper will not be published in, in, in the journal, you will desk react it uh, within 24 or 48 hours. That, that was something we do in Ambio. And I think these kind of quicker decisions, not burning the, the review communities is a good way to go. Mm. Um, otherwise, to be as transparent as we can in everything, um, to, to yeah. That's, that's what we do. Mm. Quite recently, I saw a, a compilation of uh, frequent reviewers, and there were some people who were almost professional reviewers. The, the numbers were totally astounding. So they probably do nothing else than review manuscripts. But yeah, that's a different story. So the last words in, in this round goes to, to Gustav. What can we as scientists do? Um, well, I, I think that it is very important that we focus on, on the scholars, I, I've said it already, and it is about not thinking about publishing as the final result of the research that we are doing, but rather as an integral part of the actual research that we do. Already when we apply for the funding, we often state how we will publish our results, more or less, or how we plan to publish it. And then we can plan where we publish. Uh, there have been a lot of good suggestions already, but I would say that looking into the journal where you plan to, to send your manuscript, do you, do you want to read the articles that are there? Are there any readers in that journal that will read your material if you submit it there? Otherwise, you will just throw it away. Then you, I don't think that you should publish it at all. And of course, this comes from the idea of the incentives in, in the, uh, the what we almost can call the citation culture that we... It's a term created by Paul Wouters at Center for the, uh, the Theory of Science and Technology Studies in Leiden. And he, he says that we have changed our way of, of publishing into more looking at where we publish rather than um, what we publish. And trying to get cited becomes a goal in itself instead of communicating our research. And uh, of course, uh, we, we mentioned that uh, um, senior researchers are, are uh, often found here also, but we can also see that doctor students get very much trapped when they submit an, a, a manuscript to, to these kinds of journals. Then when it's time for, for the public defense, the, the defense gets stopped or maybe uh, you cannot uh, uh, do a public defense because the articles in the thesis are found in these journals. And that I would say is the responsibility of the supervisor, 99.9%. And I think that it is very important for us as researchers to be able to distinguish what is and what isn't a problematic venue in our specific research area. And that we should be careful not to look at the incentives coming upwards from the, the systems of, of uh, fi financial systems and so on, but rather look at how we can evaluate research instead of measuring it. So that is uh, one way of, of talking about it. Mm. Uh, the common theme in many of the comments has been quality and quality control. All right, let's turn to the Q&A session now. Uh, we've received a few, as I said, uh, and uh, has anyone on the panel had a chance to look at them? Uh, I turn to you and uh, feel free to, to pick any of the questions you have found there. Um, I will start looking at them now. Um, someone asks for a more about the predatory conferences. Uh, maybe we touched upon that a couple of times after the question was asked. Um, anyone who would like to add anything on the extent of that problem? Yeah, I, I, as Stefan said, I, I think was that most reports are of an anecdotal character and there have been a couple of such reports in the literature explaining how it can happen. But um, my impression is that that seems to be less of a problem for Swedish researchers, uh, where we also 
pay from from grants participation in conferences also for young scientists and uh, PhD students. Uh, this may be more of a problem for those who choose themselves and pay out of their own pocket, which makes the problem even worse for them, of course. But maybe it is not such a big problem here. Lynn wants to say something. I just wanted to say that there's also, it's kind of very complicated figuring out what's actually a predatory conference or not, because mm -hmm. just like the journals, there's the whole spectrum. So there's the obvious dubious conferences, especially when you get invited to things that are completely outside your specialty. But just sharing a couple of personal experiences. So when I was a postdoc in the US, I convinced my supervisor to send me to a theoretical chemistry conference in the Caribbean, in Antigua and Barbuda. And he actually agreed. Now, this was by a uh, professional conference organizer, which is two former Oxbridge PhD students who essentially decided to start organizing conferences. Everything about this should scream scam conference. However, some fairly eminent people in my field had also decided to go, as well as some mid-level eminent people. So whatever the goals of the conference organizers were, this was actually a very successful conference at a resort in the Caribbean. I would probably lift my eyebrows very much if one of my group members wanted to go to a conference in the Caribbean. And there's also a conference called Pacificam, which in Hawaii, which sounds like it should be a scam conference, but it's actually a very, very important chemistry conference with people from all over the world coming. And so I think this is what makes it very, very hard for researchers. These at least are glossy enterprises. There's also the, there are conferences organized on low budget that are completely legit. So I really think uh, this gray zone of conferences that may or may not be predatory, it makes it very hard for people to establish new conferences, especially if they don't have glossy budgets for glossy websites or the branding of something like the ACS. And I think researchers really need more help navigating this, especially researchers less familiar with the conference scene, because even for senior established researchers, it can be challenging. So it's a big thing. And it's good that the report takes it up. Yeah, uh, here's an, another question. Um, it says, uh, it goes like this, read and publish agreements were mentioned. Such agreements might solve some problems, for example, by making lower uh, APCs uh, um, costs less attractive, such journals. My question is, how do we deal with the fact that some of these agreements cover publishers, such as, for instance, MDPI, that are clearly using predatory practices? Um, who will, Gustav. Yes, I would very much like to answer that because I think that this is a little bit problematic. Uh, the Bibsum Consortium has decided to uh, create deals with, uh, for example, this publisher and a couple of other publishers uh, that are so-called uh, fully gold open access publishers. Uh, but the deal is not a traditional read and publish deal, meaning that the, the system is flipped, but rather it's a rebate deal. So I think there is a 10% rebate. And I think, first of all, I should say that not all, I, Lynn mentioned this, uh, one of, uh, this kind of, of uh, publishers before, and they can have a hit and miss uh, practice, I would say, because there are some good journals and there are some journals that actually get up on these blacklists or, or in, in different ways. Uh, but um, uh, I think that for them, it's very lucrative to, uh, uh, that, uh, that we have struck a deal with them because they can say that Swedish researchers have the opportunity, they, we have a deal with Sweden, uh, and therefore uh, we, you should publish with us. But uh, I still think that we need to be careful when we choose to, to publish with these uh, publishers because some journals are very good and some are less. And it's not always the impact factor that you can use either to uh, evaluate this because some of them, they, they publish so much so they create their own impact factor in a way uh, or uh, are part of, of uh, deals with uh, journals that cite each other in a way that they get high, high impact factors. So we cannot use just one indicator, but we need to use many different indicators. But actually, these are not uh, read and publish deals is one of the answers. And we should, I think that we should be a bit careful with striking rebate deals in this way. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks, Stefan. I must uh, add to Gustav here, here that uh, a question for you, Gustav. How often do researchers come to you and tell about their experiences with journals? Uh, I can tell you that MDPI in Uppsala, the, the people working at the library were so dismayed by various reports about how researchers found the experience of dealing with MDPI that 
uh, and and I sort of mm. was aware of them being criticized. So we we joined forces, and after a couple of years, we we put away that deal, ten percent deal, because we don't want to drive people into bad experiences with scientific publishing. It takes time and you lose momentum in your research project and getting it out there and so on. So it's no use to do that. So I absolutely agree with you. And But that points then to another mm. responsibility of the researcher, namely to speak about their experiences to people, for example, like you and me. Exactly. Uh, and uh, I'd like to take a couple of other questions sure. quickly at do the that. end here. Uh, uh, Another group of experts is, of course, the librarians, and I have received help several times from librarians. And uh, here is a question from one uh, about the role. And so I'm wondering how, how much communication is there with the librarians in our universities? Stefan and Gustav, or Lynn knows perhaps. I'm coming, I think there, the researchers don't communicate as much as we should with librarians and this should change. Now I'm very engaged in open science policy. I'm on multiple editorial and editorial advisory boards. And so I engage with librarians a lot in this context. And I think what's really important is that librarians know many things about the practice of science that researchers don't. And this is a problem when these two communities don't communicate, but in the context of predatory publishing, and I'm again, focusing on these gray zone publishers without naming any specific publishers. Publisher, it can be much harder for librarians to know who's doing sketch things, especially if researchers don't communicate with librarians. And that's how you can also get into problematic situations where you get into things like uh, high profile publishing deals that then the dubious publisher can use to promote to other people. The, that's the publishing agreement equivalent of the APC waiver for prestigious scientists. And so as Stefan mentioned with a specific publisher, I think a dialogue between researchers and librarians is really, really important. I I know from experience researchers do not get engaged as much in policy because researchers are just trying to survive in the academic rat race and so on but really we are all part of an ecosystem so i encourage my fellow researcher colleagues in this zoom call and to tell your colleagues please communicate with librarians and policy makers we need two-way dialogue so probably we should strive to organize that somehow uh, here's a quick one at the very end before we finish. Do Swedish universities have official guidelines or instructions for publishing practices? Stefan and Gustav? I wish I could answer, but I cannot. I think some have, uh, they have publishing uh, guidelines, but not always regarding a uh, question about publishing, I would say, but some have it. No. I mean, we have it, for example, on, on the PhD level at Uppsala, that we, we actually have a, you, you, it's not acceptable to, to publish in non-reputable journals. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so you know, on that level, we could, we could have more, absolutely. Yeah. That's one of the conclusions, I think. All right, I'm afraid the time is up for us. So with that, I wish to thank our distinguished panel and the presenters for a very fruitful discussion about very serious matters. Um, so thank you very much indeed for participating. And let's all help to disseminate this report from IAP so this gets widely known so that each and every one of us ca can take action in the best possible way. Before we close, I encourage you to check uh, coming events in the Academy of Sciences on our website. There are many events in the weeks ahead, so I'm sure many of you can find something that is of interest to you. So I hope to see you there. Thank you all for participating and goodbye. Thank you for organizing. Thank you very much. Yeah, perfect. Thanks so much. Thanks.